Hello and welcome to Sprott Radio. I'm your host, Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Partner at Sprott Asset Management. I'm pleased to welcome Benton Arnett, Director of Markets and Policy at the Nuclear Energy Institute out of Washington, D.C. Benton, thank you for joining Sprott Radio. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ed. Well, Benton, before we dive into the world of nuclear energy, being a new guest on Sprott Radio, please tell us a bit about yourself and the work you're doing over at the Nuclear Energy Institute. Yeah, happy to. So I'm the Director of Markets and Policy here at, at NEI. So I manage a lot of our interaction with uh, what we, we call kind of non-traditional applications for nuclear. So when we start thinking about process heat and hydrogen production and a lot of the behind the meter applications we see, I help create those strategic partnerships and, and put uh, our members in contact with, with new customers. And then uh, another really big focus of ours has been outreach to the investor community. So helping to educate the financial community and, and investors so they understand what to expect on the horizon for nuclear. Well, I tell you, expectations are everything, particularly when you're talking about Wall Street, right? They love trying to get ahead of the curve here. Before we dive into some of these topics, though, we all know about nuclear energy, but 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 I think it'd be helpful to define nuclear energy and talk a little bit really about what it is, a reactor, how it works. Give us a little bit of that first before we dive into some of these other topics. Yeah. When I talk with folks about nuclear energy, I think it's uh, one of those topics that can be sometimes hard to approach. You know, we we think about all the science that goes into it and all the very complex physics. But, you know, at the end of the day, when we're looking at a nuclear power plant, it's essentially a large water boiler. It works very similarly to, to other thermal power plants on the back end when it uh, is producing steam and, and turning a turbine to produce electricity. How we create that energy, though, is different. So in a traditional thermal plant, you're looking at combusting some type of fuel through that combustion process you get heat and then you also have emissions associated with that in nuclear we're actually taking atoms and we're splitting them and so through that process we're able to get you know this massive amount of energy and without a lot of the byproducts that you see in in other uh, combustion focused thermal plants we can't really cover nuclear without first and foremost probably covering the safety of nuclear, right? I think for for many years, right or wrong, people have that concern. Where are we right now from a technology standpoint? Where are we from a safety standpoint as relates to nuclear? Yeah, so nuclear has always been, you know, one of the safest ways to produce electricity. I think a lot of folks don't realize that looking at some of the the incidents that they get a lot of news coverage, but but actually when you look at the massive amount of energy that nuclear produces on a per megawatt hour basis, it, it is the safest way to produce energy in the world. And uh we we see that trend continuing and actually getting better with some of the new reactors that are coming online. Well, you know, you talk about safety, and as we look to kind of get to this carbon neutral future, right, 2050, 2030, you know, depending on who you talk to and and some of the goals, it's clearly also one of the cleanest energies out there. Talk about that a bit and talk about the environmental impact or lack of impact that nuclear has. I love that question because I think nuclear is one of those silent contributors. A lot of folks don't realize it's producing 20% of of our uh, national electricity consumption uh, here in the U.S. and and has been doing that, you know, very quietly for for decades. And when we look at the carbon emission side of that and the environmental benefits, uh, it is the largest carbon-free generator of power in in the country. And so a lot of folks, I think, are are struck by that. We hear a lot about uh, new deployments of renewables, which is wonderful. We're going to need a lot of new renewables in this country. But still, even with all of those renewables, nuclear is, is our number one carbon-free generation source. And, and you see that consumption of energy. It, it seems to me that, you know, in the late 90s, or early 2000s, if you look at just consumption of nuclear or electricity produced by nuclear, it seemed to peak back then. But it seems to be growing again. You know, what kind of growth or enthusiasm are you seeing over the last decade or so as relates to nuclear? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, we we saw a large build out of nuclear reactors in the U.S. in the 70s and the early 80s. We've had a bit of a lull in that build out. We have been able to match some new production increases through uprates. So taking our existing power plants and, and making them produce more power. 
through some technological advancements and, and also through increasing the capacity factor of the plants through process improvements. But we, we're seeing new nuclear start to get built in this country, which is a really exciting thing. Your listeners have probably heard a little bit about the Vogel plants in Georgia. So Vogel 3, which uh, just produced first power earlier this year, I uh, expected to come online pretty shortly. Uh, and then Vogel 4, which will follow later this year or early next year. So those will be the first you know, truly new plants built in this country in, in several decades. But then we're seeing a lot of interest come in from advanced reactors. So we have a, a whole new generation of, uh, of reactor technologies that operate differently than how our, our previous reactors have, have operated and uh, are able to do some really cool things that unlock uh, industrial applications and um, some new uh, uh, new areas for, for production that didn't previously exist. So we're, we're seeing a huge opportunity for new clear to to have an upswing here in the next decade. Let's dive into that for a bit because you hear about the existing reactors that are out there and they're productive and they're creating energy. And I think you said 20% of, of the electricity in the U.S. comes from nuclear today. We're also hearing about existing reactors having their lifespans extended. And then there's some that are being decommissioned. And then to your point, all these new reactors that are coming online. I wonder if you could break down each one of those. Let's start with the active ones first and then kind of work our way through that list. And just give us a little bit of an insight into each one of those categories, if you would. Yeah, happy to. So, you know, as you mentioned, you know, historically we've been right around 20% of of the electricity production. We're down to about 18% now, but you know, that varies a little bit based on uh, kind of what the grid mix looks uh, like seasonally. With the current fleet, one of the trends that we saw over probably the last 15 years was a rise in what we call early retirements. And so what that means is these plants were, were operational, their equipment was good, they could, you know, in theory, continue a- operating for a long time, but they had faced some economic issues, uh, mostly due to really low prices of natural gas, but also due to some, some market dynamics that were created by subsidies for, for wind. And so there were a lot of areas in the U.S. where we would see power prices dip negative. And I always tell folks, selling anything at a negative price is a pretty bad business. <laughs> and, uh, and so what we've seen, though, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about it later, is nuclear is finally starting to get credit for the value it provides to the grid as a baseload resource and starting to be recognized by policymakers as a, a necessary contributor to combating climate change. And so uh, with that, we've, we've really seen that tide turn. And so I expect a lot of our existing reactors to continue to operate for a long time. When when we look at the licensing of reactors, they're licensed on an initial basis for 40 years, but that's not really based on any technical requirements. It's really just the NRC saying, you know, after 40 years, we need to take a look at this and make sure you're good to go. And, and w- once you've received that approval, you get an additional 20 year license and you can continue to do those subsequent license renewals indefinitely. And so we think a lot of our, our plants are going to operate out into the 2050s uh, and continue to provide that great amount of carbon-free power that, that we desperately need. So when you hear the term extended, it, it's really not as scary as it sounds. It's not like some old crickety plant just you know getting taped together. These are simply technology still there, the quality still there, the safety still there. They're really just extending the licensing, it sounds like. That's absolutely right. You know, they are constantly going in and doing operation maintenance, replacing components as they wear out and and making sure that these plants are operating at the absolute highest safety standards. And so when we start thinking about license extensions, that's really just a regulatory formality, not not something I, I think folks should be concerned about at all. That's very clear and and very good to know. Let's talk about the new ones. I think that's probably where the most excitement is coming in from, whether it's from an energy creation standpoint or from an investment standpoint, you know, from Wall Street's point of view. Talk about some of the new reactors that are happening, what they look like, how they're different than maybe the, the reactors we know today. Backing up a little bit, when we think about our current reactor fleet, it, it operates as what we call light water reactors. And so uh, that just means they use water as both their coolant and their moderator. And that's a really great technology. It's worked well for us for a long time. And we still see a huge value case for that going forward as well. But one of the, the limitations that having a light water reactor um, results in is, is a little lower temperature output. So the current fleet operates around 300 degrees Celsius, which is perfectly good for electricity 
heat production. You can do some great thermal applications for that too on, on the lower end. But when we start looking at these industrial applications and, and things like process heat or some advanced forms of, of hydrogen production, you're really going to need a much higher temperature outlet. And so some of the reactors that we're seeing being developed today are shifting away from using water and they use things like high temperature gas or liquid sodium or molten salt. And so switching over to those new types of, of moderators and coolants can result in temperature outputs up to six, seven, eight hundred degrees Celsius. And so that that all of a sudden is producing really high quality steam. And we see industrial users looking at that and saying, well, I can go take my facility that currently uses natural gas to provide all of that heat and I can switch it over to using nuclear instead. One thing, you know, I think is important to put in context around the conversation when we think about industrial applications is emissions in the U.S., about 25 percent of them come off from grid electricity. And there's a ton of focus on decarbonizing the grid, but 30 percent of our emissions come from industrial applications. And so if we're going to decarbonize that sector, we need to build out almost an entire other grid worth of power. And so it's just a massive opportunity. And, and we're really excited about these new designs and, and the, the opportunities they have there. And where are we from a time frame on it? Is that a year from now, 10 years from now? What, what's that looking like? Yeah, so there's three projects in the United States right now that are all uh, supported through the Department of Energy. Um, the first is a project with NuScale, partnered with UAMPS, uh, deploying their reactor technology in, in Idaho. That project is set to be uh, online by the end of the decade. We also have two projects that were awarded under what's called the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program at the Department of Energy. Uh, one is a TerraPower reactor, which is a liquid sodium reactor that is looking to be deployed in Kimmer, Wyoming. That's also set to be online towards the end of this decade. And then uh, another project under that same Department of Energy program is with X Energy and their high temperature gas reactor. They have a partnership with Dow to decarbonize a, a Dow facility in Texas. And that facility is also set to be online before 2030. So sitting here in 2023, we, we think we're going to have these things online in the next you know five to seven years. That's amazing. And you mentioned something about decarbonizing. So if I'm hearing this correctly, are you saying that there's existing plants, maybe coal plants or other types of plants that are being converted to nuclear plants? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. That is something that we've been working a lot on and, and have identified as a, a huge opportunity. This coal to nuclear transition is, is what we, we're calling it. Actually, that TerraPower project I mentioned earlier in Wyoming, they identified this opportunity to site their plant in the same area as a retiring coal plant. Uh, and so they went out to the community in Wyoming and they said, you know, we want to do uh, as much of a consent-based siting approach to this as we can. And actually ended up with four coal communities competing to host this first facility. Now, in, in the infrastructure world, that's unheard of, right? No, yeah. Communities are, are usually, you know, the first in line to push back against these type of projects. But actually what we find is these coal communities see this as a huge opportunity for jobs, huge opportunity for economic uh, opportunity uh, and advancement. And they're also willing to dive into the, the facts and the figures and, and really understand the technology. And once they've done that, they're, they're very comfortable with it and, and excited to move forward. And so we're seeing that already taking place in Wyoming. Uh, we expect to see some more of those projects announced around the country in the coming years as well. From an outsider, not totally plugged into this, this world, that seems like a game changer to me. If you're getting those types of transitions, if you're getting that type of job creation, that's just got to be incredible to be part of that. Yeah, it's huge. It's, it's huge for the nuclear industry, but it's also huge for these communities. You know, as these coal plants retire, what we see is it's a huge economic driver for a lot of these areas. They employ most of the workers. They provide a significant amount of the tax base. And so, you know, a lot of these communities are, are facing a lot of uncertainty and, and nuclear really provides them this hope that they can continue to, to have this economic prosperity that they've seen for, for previous decades. So uh, we're excited about it from the perspective of deploying new nuclear, but, but also really excited at the opportunity to help these communities and make sure that they're able to continue on with the livelihood that they've known for so long. Well, Benton, you know, talking about policy and talking about tax base, you, know, you guys are front and center working out of Washington, D.C. So you get to hear about all the policies that are going on out there. How impactful was the Inflation Reduction Act to the world of nuclear? What, what did that mean for you all? I don't think I can 
overstate how important the Inflation Reduction Act was. It is probably the single largest piece of legislation to advance nuclear energy that we've seen since the 50s or 60s. So one of the the issues that we've faced for a while is a a lack of recognition of the the contributions that nuclear energy provides to the grid. It's baseload, it's carbon-free, it provides this just reliable, clean power 24-7. Inflation and Reduction Act is the first time we've seen nuclear reach parity with other energy technologies that have similar similar characteristics. And so one of the things that the Congress did in that act was they provided a production tax credit to help support the existing fleet, recognizing that those operations are going to require continual investments. And as I mentioned earlier, there's some market dynamics that really unfairly punish uh, some of the existing fleets. And so this production tax credit for the existing fleet is going to help us keep those reactors online out to the 2050s. The other piece is that we finally were included in a technology neutral approach to production tax credits and investment tax credits. Previously, you had credits for various energy technologies and Congress said, really, we need to be focused on what the output of those technologies are. And so we see nuclear finally receiving the same level of tax credit as wind and solar, geothermal, hydro. And so that's going to be really huge as we look to build new plants. And then the the third piece I would add in there is there's a a large amount of financing support. So the IRA provided a lot of loan authority to the Department of Energy through their loan programs office to help do loan guarantees for new carbon-free projects, which nuclear qualifies for. When we look at nuclear and we look at how that capital allocation works, large upfront capital, but then a very long, long operational lifetime. And so if you're able to get that borrowing cost down just a little bit, it can really change your project economics dramatically. And so we think that's going to be a really huge piece of the the puzzle as we move forward as well. Well, talking about the puzzle, I mean, I think the final piece will be Wall Street, right? You've got government support. It sounds like, you know, using Wyoming as an example, you've got community support, which is spectacular. Um, how about Wall Street support? Are you starting to see capital flow into this space? Are you starting to have conversations with an investor base um, that is showing interest in this space? What, from Wall Street's point of view, where are we? Yeah, well, so Wall Street has been a great partner in recent years moving forward with this uh, these projects. And so one of the things we've seen that has really changed is the view of nuclear from a sustainable investing standpoint. Previously, nuclear was was in the, the bad category, right? We were lumped in mm-hmm. with tobacco and firearms and all of the, the exclusionary categories for ESG investing. And we're really starting to see folks re-envision that. They look at the government efforts. They look at all the government support. They look at the models that show how much nuclear is going to be needed to meet our climate goals. Uh, IP, IPCC uh, released a report last Last year, that said we're going to need $100 billion of investment every year in nuclear energy if we want to meet our goals. And so financial community has taken notice of that. I think the first step was, as you mentioned, showing the policy support. So the EU, including nuclear and their green taxonomy, was absolutely huge. Um, in Canada, we've seen green bonds start to come out for nuclear, which, which were a first. That's created a lot of confidence among the investment community that this is something that is sustainable. But at the end of the day, Wall Street wants to make money. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game. And so they need to see those economic returns that are possible. And as they start to dive into the technologies and they look at not only the technological advancements that have happened, but also the uh, massive amounts of carbon-free power that we're going to need here in the coming years, they see that value. And so we've seen several nuclear energy companies go public over the, the last couple of years. So New Scale uh, went public through a, a SPAC merger last year. X Energy is in the, the process of going public through a, another SPAC merger. We saw Brookfield Renewables purchase Westinghouse. Uh, and so we're starting to see a lot of deals develop in this space. And we, we did an analysis that looked at nuclear-related Wall Street deals over the last, you know, I don't know, probably five to 10 years. And what we found was in, in the last five years, we've had about a 400% increase in those types of deals. So so the numbers show it, the, the anecdotes show it. And I think that trend is going to continue here uh, in the future for quite some time. Well, I know Wall Street loves to hear the word 400% increase. That's, that's always a good number to throw <laughs> out there. <laughs> um, before we sign off, are there anything or any topics or points 
that I didn't ask that you think the listeners would, would find interesting? Anything else out there that, that you want to leave us with? You know, I, I think one of the things I would I would I would want everyone to recognize is that we've we've just had so much technological advancement in this space that when we think about nuclear traditionally, we think about these very large gigawatt scale reactors. And that's just not that's not where the world's headed, and that's not where a lot of these technology advancements have it. Don't get me wrong, we are absolutely gonna have a need for those gigawatt scale reactors going forward. But we've also developed a lot of these small modular reactors. We have micro reactors coming down the, the pipe. So any shape, size that you might need, there's a technology solution being developed for that. And also any temperature you need. As we mentioned before, you know, the applications are just growing and, and the ability for nuclear to meet that, that process heat need and those other uh, technology applications are, are um only increasing, you know, kind of by the year. And so if you've looked at nuclear in the past and and maybe uh, weren't, weren't convinced, I encourage you to come back and, and take a second look because we've changed quite a bit over the last couple decades. Well, that's clear on your website. And, and I really encourage all of our listeners to go to the Nuclear Energy Institute website, which is nei.org. And I would tell you that the first place I would go is the resource section. I spend a lot of time on that preparing for this this podcast and there's some really cool stats and facts there and take a look at it on your state level there it shows you uh, on a state by state level what percent of of energy if any is coming from nuclear in your state and it's just kind of a really cool informative website to check out so i encourage you to do that benton really a, a treat to have you on and hopefully we'll have you back as this continues to progress Ed, always happy to come back, and uh, thanks for having me on. Well, wonderful. And, and once again, I'm your, your host, Ed Coyne, and, and thank you all for listening to Sprott Radio. This podcast is provided for information purposes only from sources believed to be reliable. However, Sprott does not warrant its completeness or accuracy. Any opinions and estimates constitute our judgment as of the date of this material and are subject to change without notice past performance is not indicative of future results. This communication is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any financial instrument. Any opinions and recommendations herein do not take into account individual client circumstances, objectives or needs and are not intended as recommendations of particular securities, financial instruments or strategies. You must make your own independent decisions regarding any securities, financial instruments or strategies mentioned or related to the information herein. This communication may not be redistributed or retransmitted in whole or in part or in any form or manner without the express written consent of Sprott. Any unauthorized use or disclosure is prohibited. Receipt and review of this information constitutes your agreement not to redistribute or retransmit the contents and information contained in this communication without first obtaining express permission from an authorized officer of Sprott.